Software development is complex. Anyone who works within it knows this very well. The job of a programmer is to solve problems. That's it. No matter the area of expertise, the language or the platform, this is what we do. Now, my role over the past 20 something years has covered a variety of languages from Pascal, Cobalt, Python, VBS, VBA, Java and C and variants thereof. Now, depending on what you want to achieve, you pick your tools. Some languages or even types are better than others. But the reality is, though, you tend to use more than just one. And these come in two main guises. Scripting languages. Now, if you want to maintain a simple, predictable process or algorithm that is called from your core code, then a scripting language such as Python, PHP or JavaScript will do this perfectly. At a simple level, scripting languages do not require compilation before they are used and they can be called within your code at runtime and processed a line or a stack level at a time via an interpreter, making them easier to maintain, update and expand on. Games, applications and all kinds of things use these all the time and they can be and are very powerful and very controllable. Now the other one is much lower level languages, but what I'm going to call compiled languages for ease of split. These are the norm for games, big dense programs such as backend software, drivers, operating systems and of course game engines themselves. They enable you to do pretty much anything you want with them and because they are mostly object orientated you can use libraries, shared functions or features, classes that you can call within your code or roll your own the old school way. Now this is why you see loads of include at the top of code as this is the libraries or the libs being referenced so that your code needs it when it is compiled and the linker brings all these elements into your XE or cleans them out if you don't need it to try and keep it as small as possible. Now this compilation process here is key as unlike the scripting language we just mentioned you have to compile your code to run on the target device or the VM so that it matches the relevant instructions for that target. The downside is they can be and are more complex. You tend to have to manage more states, memory instantiation, allocation, etc, etc. And they can bloat at times with more code and libs than you really need. Now all of these point down to the lowest level that we usually get into, which is assembler. One level up from the lowest, which is machine code, binary. Now assembler is what used to be used back in the 16-bit days and prior on consoles. And it still was used up to and including the PS3 and 360 but at a much, much lower level. Now, this option isn't really an option anymore. People talk about coding to the metal, but I'll touch on that in a moment. So why this brief summary of code then? Well, you see, all of this is only the tip of the iceberg. When you write code to run to solve your problem, it will normally run perfectly on the exact machine and target you wrote it for. Not always a guarantee, mine, but... Any deviation from this, no matter how big or small, may cause unforeseen issues or it may just fail completely. Why? Now, as discussed way back with my next-gen PS5 video a couple of years ago, this is because many more elements come into a great solution actually becoming a usable one. For ease of this video, we'll keep the variables as low as possible, but it will affect the CPUs and or the GPUs you are targeting along with the vendors themselves and between those ar architectures. What this means is what runs on an AMD Zen 1 may not run at all or as well on a Zen 3 or vice versa. This is where the compilers come into it. They take your source code and they turn it into machine code, the lowest level you can get just as described. Now these are written for the target machine or software. And these can introduce issues in your code that you then have to solve, as in the end, they are simply translating your C++ into the target instructions. Entire teams work on writing assembly code, machine code it will become, for the relevant target of hardware, be it a new CPU, a GPU, motherboard memory subsystem. From this, compilers are also written that take your instructions from your relevant engine language and translate them into the most efficient assembler for the target hardware, and more specifically, what that target hardware can do. Now, what I mean by this is some hardware is better than others. For example, if you have a CPU that has no multiply, stepping back in time now, then you'll need to loop through your code X amount of times to achieve the same result. Now, if it does, then this exact same 100 loop function becomes a simple two register multiply and then a memory move back into system RAM. 
Recall these instructions or operations, you can only do these one at a time with the relevant speed of the CPU or GPU. So the more efficient you are here, then the more you can do in that clock rate. That's how it works. Now, all of this means that when you compile this to your specific piece of code, this is what hardware efficiency means. If it knows that it can do this, and the specific compiler knows that, then it translates your code into the most efficient machine code for the target hardware, i.e. it uses the multiplier and it doesn't use the add. Modern compilers are arguably much better now than humans at doing this. The other option is you write your code to manipulate the compiler, to do what you want it to do, or you design it from the start much better. Now, most developers I work with have no idea of assembler or registers or even the CPU, the GPU or the RAM. They just write the solution and submit it to the build pipe. And they don't have to. That's exactly how a lot of modern programming works. And this will be true for many game programmers or artists that do not need to go this deep. But there are those that need to or want to, and specifically coding like this and having this knowledge is beneficial and required. GPU and engine programmers predominantly care massively about this. So based on all these complex, but really only a light touch of myriad of variables that can happen, this is just across four current consoles and those C of PC specs, this seems very, very daunting then. How many CPUs are there in the market? How many GPUs? How many different variations of those? How on earth do developers get anything to work across all this lot and actually ship a game? Step forward, APIs, Application Programming Interfaces. This is the reason why many coders that work around me and with me don't care about the hardware. These are, for want of a fuller description, a collection of functions and features the game developer can call to get something done. This may be to move some data, update a field on a screen, retrieve a record from a database, draw a triangle, play a sound file, or anything else required. The beauty of them is someone else has done all the low-level work to abstract it, i.e. simplify the ability to connect to multiple clients if it's a web-based application, or run software across many pieces of hardware. APIs are things like REST, SOAP, ODBC or DirectX, GNM or even graphics card drivers and Windows itself all have and need them. These are all written for the target and expose the variety of functions to the relevant client who wants to use them. These are only as good or as bad as the functions written within them and what they actually expose to the programmer and actually how well they've been implemented. Back in the 16-bit days, these never really existed. Not really that much in the 32-bit days either. This is where the coding to the metal comes from. Writing your own assembler program means you need to have a great deal of understanding for the specific hardware and it will only run on that specific hardware or VM as it is bespoke to the instruction sets of it, as our example earlier covered. These days, this doesn't really happen. I know that some PS3 and 360 did have some games or engines that did this, and I'm sure Sony still may do this at times, which is why they've adopted a hardware-based emulation rather than a software one like Microsoft, but most third-party will use the relevant API from DirectX 12 on Xbox and GNM and the higher and closer to DirectX and GNMX that PlayStation offers. But prior to this, Xbox had DirectX 9 and 360 and 11 when the Xbox One launched, and Sony used LibGCM and the higher PSGL, which were relevant to the PS3 only, and obviously the Xbox. And both teams spend a great deal of time, money and effort within these studios, such as the Xbox SDK and ATG teams and the ICE or SN systems within Sony. Long story short, with the next generation of consoles, we will see new SDKs, new APIs, new compilers and tools to support the new hardware and pipeline changes. So why do we care about all this then? What the hell has this got to do with next gen consoles? Well, two reasons. Let's take the one that many are most excited about. Backwards compatibility. We've got over 600 titles in the backward compatibility catalog but we're kind of moving on to a new part of the story. We're heading into a new generation of Xbox, Scarlet. The goal of the team is to make every single game that you play on Xbox One today 
work on the Scarlet device. Now, the real gem of the Xbox has been its backwards compatibility. Bringing PC-like scaling over to the console was not only a real positive for the market and mindshare, it was a titanic feat in development prowess, largely due to the reasons I just mentioned. The Xbox 360 was a power PC CPU with a very different GPU and instruction set. Now, to pull this off, Microsoft had to create some serious and heavy software-based solutions, some of which was helped by minor hardware functions in the one and texture format specifically, and maybe a few others. The core basis of this completely different RISC-based CPU to CISC-based one within the Xbox One was handled by a decompile. That's a reverse compiled bytecode back into your source code and then a recompile back into an x86 format that can be run natively on the host hardware. Again, as we've just discussed, somebody would have written this to do this particular job and then reuse it to run through the new compiler. And that's where these lessons all pay off because you now know what I'm talking about and it doesn't just sound like drivel. Now this is not enough on its own though, as the software will still not work at all. Just because it runs on that relevant piece of hardware, it still needs to communicate with something or some other element, the operating system and the GPU and all those areas via those APIs. This is the second part of BC here. A full VM virtual machine is included within the new download file that comes with the game. Even if you own the disk, this is only the DRM gateway to the get this download. From here, the emulator running as an application on the Xbox One, just like a game, handles all the calls from the relevant game into the operating system layer, which fully emulates the 360 OS and dash. Any requests are converted to support any changes that are deeper in the system, such as floating point, which is different between the two systems, branching, which is vastly different, and even the speed of operation. This emulation layer is possible from the APIs, that recompile and those abstraction layers that sit between the low-level hardware and the high-level application. Long story short, a great deal of effort, tweaking, changes, testing and improvements to the core emulator in software was required to achieve this milestone. The emulator now generally runs all 360 games better than original hardware, and this can even include improvements such as I've covered over the years in titles such as Halo Reach, The Witcher 3, Lord of the Shadows, and many, many more. You can check them out on my channel if you're interested in the backwards compatibility playlist. But the X can go further with 4K resolutions on the original Xbox and 360 titles even. All of this and not a single line of game code is touched, as it is all done at the API or the driver level with sufficient hardware headroom to enable this to happen within the call and still deliver a faster experience. This is also why frame rates tend to stay as they are, but resolution can be easier improved. Much of this comes from the vast memory increase on the one, meaning game assets and code can stay resident in RAM, truly a brilliant piece of work from the Microsoft team and is a core USP and a tentpole feature for the Xbox brand. The next one is boost modes, those native boost modes. Remember this word. The same functions apply to the X over the one, but on a much lower level, as the core hardware in CPU and GPU is close enough to the one that it can run the exact same code, and it certainly runs the same APIs and operating systems, so the instruction sets are the same, or as close as. And as they go through the core API on the new machines, the changes present, and there will be many, can be handled by that to ensure an almost seamless operation that will improve performance and resolutions if they were part of the original game code. Like backwards compatibility games, no game code is touched as long as the game uses the relevant operating system and API versions when shipped, it is predictable and manageable, as all programmers want. This means the extra hardware from RAM, CPU and GPU means that games run better natively on the X than they do on the One. But to get the most from it, you need to recompile a patch that uses the latest version and therefore the hardware 
as it is still limited to the native mode not having full access to the GPU compute units. And this all depends on the software development version and the API it was programmed for. And this is the reason why older titles only use around half the GPU and newer titles in native mode will use all of it from 2018 to 2019. Again, this shows you how much this level affects the potential of the results. And I covered this right back from launch with The Witcher 3. It hit 60 FPS in many sections, and it wasn't really CPU bound most of the time. It was actually GPU bound as we discussed. And that was the most limiting factor within its unlocked frame rate and 900p resolution disk version. But come a full specific update patch later to fully use all the hardware and updated API, it ran at 4K above 1080p or 1440p I believe at 60 FPS on the exact same hardware and actually or arguably even slightly better performance. Two sides of the BC coin, one being fully emulated and the other being fully native. The thing to remember here is though that both of these versions were compiled to run on the same hardware. That exact same download would run on the Xbox One but it would ignore the code because it doesn't have access to the hardware. You're just telling it from an API level, you're asking the hardware source and then you're running the relevant code to that hardware source within the same executable. Now the Pro was very similar to this for PlayStation, with it having access to an almost identical CPU as per the X, but a doubled GPU that was very much restricted to support the PS4 in less of a software manner, but more of a hardware one. The CUs, the compute units, were doubled to 36 from the PS4's 18, and clock speeds boosted to 911 from 800 MHz. Now in boost mode, this only has access to those 18 compute units at the higher clock speed, 13%, and wider bandwidth meaning many games only see a modest boost over the base PS4 of around that 13-16% to 16 when GPU is the issue, and at best around 30% when it comes from the CPU as it has full access to those quicker clock cycles. The methods here really show a split between the two teams, and this is likely that Sony can run lower level on games than Microsoft, and as such means that teams can dig a little deeper on the hardware within the API, which benefits the games on the hardware, when they're natively made, at the expense of limiting the BC options later on without further work within the emulator. The short story is, Microsoft take a software controlled environment approach and Sony take more of a hardware centric one. This means the X runs older games with a bigger boost than the Pro does without a specific patch. But both consoles allow developers to release a new patch for the relevant machine or ship that within the XE on the disk after the machines have launched so that the same code can run and communicate with the improved hardware and instruction sets of the newer GPUs such as the ID buffer on the Pro via those updated APIs which handles the older and newer layer for them. This really shows you the power of APIs as the game developers only have to code elements for the new hardware if they want to maximize it or just let the API handle the call and manage the command buffers, the compute units, the allocations, etc. and get the most out of these premium consoles that enable higher resolution, more effects, frame rates or input times and sometimes all of them. Tell General Solo this might take a while. So with that, we've reached the end of part one of my video. The reason I've split this up is, again, because I think attention spans will wander, and I thought I'd break it down to the full description of what I'm going to reference in the descriptions about the next generation hardware, BC, environment, development, hardware, and all that kind of area so that it all makes sense and you can understand it. If you haven't watched that part, which will be up soon, if not now, then you can watch it straight after this one. I also recommend that you watch this first because I'll be talking Talking about subjects I've just covered in this video and if you haven't watched it then you might not know what the hell I'm talking about anyway as always I'm completely self-funded and independent so you know what to do support the channel get my numbers up that always helps and until then and the next video I'm gonna sit back and relax maybe have a little bath maybe not quite like Geralt though I'll see you on the next one